In this episode, we're taking a look at the star-studded first solo album from the legendary Robbie Robertson. Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 Podcast. Music, movies, galore. We've got one ask. If you listen and you like what you're hearing, go ahead and give us a rating on, on your favorite podcast provider on, on Spotify, one star each. So five stars will do us good. Apple podcast. If you're listening, give us a rating. It's just easy. You don't have to write anything. A five-star review would just go uh, so far in helping us uh, to continue to grow, right? We're, we're in a growth mode right now. We would be well appreciated. Yes. Right? We're, we're yeah. like, we're like teenage Groot. <laughs> Right now, <laughs> right we, there was like baby Groot hoping, for like a long time, and he was like small. I was like, when is he going to grow? And then all of a sudden, we, we went from get, baby. Are we going to get to the big guy at the end of we're, Guardians? Yeah, we're going to get to the big. You know, <laughs> we're we're getting there. We're yeah. we're getting to full full the size group. Group, yes, the Hulk Hulk Groot. <laughs> uh, and we can only do that with your review. So, yeah, uh, if you would be so kind, you're, you're already on the app. Just go ahead and and throw us five stars. Uh, would be so grateful. So. Um, if you could tell a little bit of a melancholy mood, and this might be a little bit of a melancholy episode, we're going to try and do the best we can to, mm-hmm. uh, to celebrate, um, as of the, the recording of this, uh, episode, Robbie Robertson just passed away recently. Full disclosure. We always had a Robbie Robertson. Robbie Robertson was always on the radar, always on the books to do an episode. So we're not mm-hmm. trying to cash in on, on anything. It's just, it, this was, uh, a guy that was, is, is one of those albums, um, that we talk about like that, why we do the podcast, right, Eric? Yeah. And it, like, it, it, you know, well, we, <clears throat> we did bring it up at, <clears throat> in our last waltz episode and I kind of thought about it. I was like, you know what? It, it occurred to me that we, we, we covered a lot of ground in that episode. We talked about solo work. We talked about his time with the band. We talked about, yeah. of course, the movie and, and, and the soundtrack. And, <clears throat> but this was the, uh, what, but what's, what's really special about this one and Dean gave me the choice, by the way. Um, you gave me the choice of either this one or Storyville, which is your preferred uh, nah, record. Either, of, record either, of one, either one. Uh, you know what? I, I b- Both of these. Uh, <laughs> okay. okay. I, honestly, like, like both. So he's like come both around. Of, he's come around. <laughs> no, b- both go hand in hand. You know, this was yeah, the I, first. I, I think This so. was the yeah. first one. This was his yeah. first uh, solo outing. Storyville was kind of the refining yeah. Of, of, of what Rob, you know, of, of Robbie Robertson as a solo artist. Okay. I'm sorry. I cut you off. Okay. So with this, I, I, we, we both came to this album, you know, not at, at the same time necessarily, but we both connected with it. Mm. I, I had heard, uh, I think it was showdown at big sky on NEW. Loved the song. Had no idea at the time who Robbie Robertson was. You hear the name Robbie Robertson. It's like yeah, he was always a name that was kicking it. Like you've heard in rock and roll on radio, or whatever. And, and, you know. Yeah, and 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 of course the DJs at the time were like, oh, you know, Robbie Robertson yeah. is coming out with a solo record. I'm like, well, what band is he in? And I, <laughs> how naive we were, or I was at the time. And and yeah. uh, you, you know, of course, you come to find out, and it's like, so I, I always considered this album to be more of a a celebratory album in in, in a way because of the people involved, the connections that he was yeah. making, um, because he hadn't very, done anything very in, in, in quite a few years. Right. I mean, it was the yeah, last very, waltz was very unique. Yeah. Let, let's get into yeah. the Yeah. They, we need, yeah. We think we need to talk a little, we'll spend a little time of yeah. la, last waltz and what Robbie Robertson was doing up until the release of this album. So what, what we're talking about is this is Robbie Robertson's uh, first solo album. Mm-hmm. And it's just simply titled Robbie Robertson. It was released in October of 1987. Uh, all songs were written or co-written by Robbie Robertson. He wrote mo- he wrote most of them by himself. Produced by Robbie Robertson and Daniel Lanois. Now Daniel Lanois, the pro- this producer, is very integral to this album. Yes. Uh, via vis a vis his connections to other artists that he was wor- worked that he worked with and was currently working with. This is a really great story about this album. Yeah. Uh, it only hit number thirty eight on Billboard. Uh, for as lauded as this was, and this was a return of, of the, the lyricist of the band, you know, 
uh, three music videos, no singles in the in the Billboard charts. It was something like mm-hmm. the rock chart, but nothing that was in the in the mainstream uh, Billboard chart. Yeah, uh, and certified gold, five hundred thousand copies. So. Yeah, it a w- lot of people might have might have missed it. Like you said, if you don't know who Robbie Robertson was, uh, it, it's gonna it's gonna come and go. And I think I need to retell the story. I think I told the story a little bit in the last Waltz episode, but I think yeah. it's mm-hmm. important to retell the, the the connection of how I came to this 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 magical album and this person was. I used to work, you know, briefly used to work in a pizzeria. I used to deliver pizza. I used to make mm-hmm. pizza. I used to. Do all that kind of stuff. That was the, the career track. And the guys, the guys that owned the pizzeria were hippies. <laughs> like, you know, they were like really like they were, you know, they were kind of already like one of them was already in his 50s. And this was in the mid 80s. So he was like, you know, a young guy in the 60s. And and they were, and this one guy, Ronnie, he was one of the owners. He was into he was into the band. He was really into it. And delivering pizza, you're working till like they would close at like 11 o'clock at night, the pizzeria. So I'm delivering till 11, 1130 if stuff are coming in. And these guys lived, uh, the pizzeria was in Ardsley, but these guys lived in Queens, but they would stay there and just hang out at the, you know, after it closed. Yeah. Ronnie, one of the owners got his hands on a big screen projection TV and they had like a party room. So he put it in there and next door to the pizzeria was a video rental place. Right. And he used to always go on about, oh, you got to watch the last walls. We got it. We got to watch the last walls. What the hell is the last walls? I kind of knew of it as a title and as a yeah, thing. Yeah. I kind of, I heard, you know, the <laughs> band. Yeah. I, I'd known about it. Got to watch. We got to watch this. We got to watch. So one night it's like late. It's like 11 o'clock. I, I'm done. He's like, oh, I, I you know, I, I got it. So it was like midnight and we watched like the last waltz. And I, I walked away from it just like, you know, go see you now go refer to our last waltz episode we won't go into the last waltz but i walked Mm -hmm. away like wow and that was probably 85 86 it was right in this area so i like the the pump was primed for this album to come out and for me to know who he was yeah yeah like it was like a part like the cosmic tumblers kind of fell into place where i just kind of got an appreciation for the band and then this came out yeah and it was That is a great story. And I mean, I knew The Last Waltz as well. I only knew it by title. I knew that Martin Scorsese had directed it. I think I might have seen it at the Pickwick. Uh They might have shown it at like like Saturday (laughs) nights. They used to show like all the rock movies and and stuff. I think I might have seen it way Uh before. But but again, I just, I didn't make the connection. You know, names at that point were, you know, I was still getting to know uh, people. But this album came... For me, it was, and, and, and as soon as I knew that, it, you know, the, the, the producer, Daniel Lenoir, I, as soon as I knew that he was co-producing it with him, I was like, okay, I'm in. Because as you know, I'm a big fan of, we, we covered So with Peter Gabriel. Yeah. He produced that album. He, we, which we was what, the league. year before? Which was the year before. That's right. And I think so most, most, likely, was, was most, most likely concurrently working with Gabriel, probably during the sessions of that album, perhaps, you know, maybe brought him yeah. in a little, you know, like around the same time. Um, I know you two were involved and with the Joshua tree. I mean, this was, I mean, this, these were very huge albums. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not surprising that this album didn't make a big splash. It almost feels like it just kind of came in between. It's like the uh, redheaded stepchild. That's of, right. Yeah. You know, D- Daniel Lanois became this producer, you know, was a, in the eighties was a big yes. time producer. Like I said, fellow he, Canadian fellow, you know, yeah. and I, and he I think produced uh, so, which was Peter Gabriel's breakthrough album, mm-hmm. right. A monster album for, for, for Gabriel. That's right. Um, Robbie Robertson in 1983 kind of announces he's, you know, so after the last waltz, he, you know, he had done some acting. He was in a movie called Carney, uh, deep friendship with Martin Scorsese. So he was working on, on film scores for Martin mm-hmm. Scorsese, either executive producing the score, writing score, selecting the music. He really like that kind of, he was looking for a new challenge. He wasn't looking to go back out on the road. So he's doing that for a while. And then he said, yeah, I'm ready to kind of reemerge and start yeah. recording again. Um, that was in, that was in 83. Um, he was working, you know, by the time, so 83, he announces it. Uh, he's ready to start working on an album, and then he had to go do the Color of Money. He mm-hmm. had to go work on the score for Color of Money. So he started with Lanois, um, but but I think so was already done by then. So it's yeah. it's kind of like you know he you know Robertson was getting ready to do everything. Connects with Daniel Lanois, like I said, a fellow Canadian. Um, 
But then Lanois had to leave and go work with you too. Cause he was already in working with them on the Joshua tree. So he was kind of like doing like a couple of things at once, Daniel Lanois. So he's like, listen, I got to go do some work with you too. And that's when uh, Robbie Robertson did the color of money. He's like, okay, well, I'm going to do the color of money. Mm -hmm. Let me work on that. And then we'll kind of, we'll kind of get back together. Um, let's go through the, the players on this album. Oh yeah. Cause this is like, you know, this is a who's, you know, and a lot of people, do, you know, the people that drag this album or if anybody has a problem with it is, is they're like, it's too Peter Gabriel centric. Right. Uh, mean, mean, you know, and, and, and you either have a problem with that or you don't. And, and it's not, I, I think it's an overstatement. I, I think so, so too, is considering yeah. he only, he only really plays on two songs. Um, yes. but I, I understand that statement. I do. Yeah. It's, it's the production. Yes. It's that familiar production of, of Lenoir. It's not production and, and some se. of the, well, some of the, the guys he uses too. Right. So you've got Tony, Le you got Tony Levin. Yes. Uh, on yeah. bass for, for a lot of the tracks, uh, Manu Kache, who's a, a percussionist and a drummer on most Phenomenal of the tracks. drummer. One of my favorites. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, Garth Hudson from the band uh, appears on two tracks. Uh, and Rick Danko appears on one track, Sonny Got Caught in the Moonlight, which, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Anyway, yeah. uh, like I said, uh, Gabriel's on 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 a couple of tracks. Uh, Abraham Laboreal on bass. He was big in the 80s. You saw him on a lot of session work that he did. Yeah. Terry Bozio. Terry Bozio from Missing Persons. That's right. Uh, yep. uh, two, two things. You know, all of you, too, appear on two tracks, right? So you've got The Edge, Adam Clayton, Larry Mullen Jr., and Bono on two tracks. Uh, the Bodines, yes. criminally under criminally underrated in the eighties. Let's point you to uh, uh, their album "Outside Looking In," which came out the the same year as this. Uh, mm -hmm. You want a companion piece of Americana? Boom. Uh, Maria McKee from the uh, the eighties uh, group Lone Justice was on this album. Ivan Neville, also son of uh, Aaron Neville, or or one of the Neville brothers. I could be. It might not be Aaron, mm -hmm. uh, but Ivan Neville is on this. So this is like a like you said a who's who of of contemporary artists that really helped uh, Robbie Robertson kind of not update his sound, but kind of bring it, you know, bring forth uh, what he was trying to do. And, and you get an album that just sounds sonically. It, this is just gorgeous. Yeah. There's not, a, there's not a misstep. It doesn't say it's 87. There's none of the electronic drums. He doesn't go, he didn't go down that path. Mm -hmm. And this album is timeless because of that. It's timeless because of it. I totally agree. And, and I think, again, it's that, it's that, it's that collaborative spirit that first of all, I, th I don't think they had met before Robertson and, and, uh, Lenoir, but they mm -hmm. connected in the sense that they both like to experiment. So, and, and of course they're <laughs> fellow Canadians. So, um, but on the other hand, it, like I, I'm looking at it too, as you know, I always admired Robbie Robertson's ability to kind of adapt and to kind of see, you know, pick his head up and look around as to what's happening on the music scene. Yeah. Be open, you know, open to it and, and be open and completely open to it. And, and, and that's what I feel like this album is. It's, it's, you know, Lenoir working with all of these people, perhaps, I don't know whose idea it was to bring these people on. Um, it could have been both. It could have been, you know, Robbie Robertson saying, Hey, well, here's the story. Let's, Let, let's get okay. it. Let's get into it. Let's get into okay. it. So, they, you know, they reconvene after the color of money. They start working on, mm -hmm. on this album, on, on Robbie Robertson album, Robbie Robertson album, Robbie Robertson's album, <laughs> Robbie Robertson, <laughs> his album, this one, <laughs> yeah, this one, this there album right here. If you're watching on YouTube, there and, it is. And by the okay. way, that is just a fantastic cover. It, yeah. it really I love, is. I love yeah. the, the, the tone of it, the, the uh -huh. kind of sepia brown. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, so he's working on this album. Robbie Robertson's writing songs and he's like, it, oh, not a not a concept album, but he goes. You know, these songs play take place in a, in a in a place called the Shadowland. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I'm and me as the lyricist, I'm I'm kind of drifting through these different areas of the Shadowland, kind of kind of uh, singing about my observations. So that's it's a great way to kind of look at this album. That, very very mystic point of view. Yeah, very yeah. mystic point of view. Yep. So he starts working on it. Right, they're they're rocking and rolling. Yep. Um, and then Lenoir says, "Listen, I got to go back." I got to go back to Ireland because I got to, I still got some stuff to do with you too. Mm -hmm. I got, you know, they're still, these guys were still in the midst of the Joshua tree. So just kind of remember where you too was at this point. This was like the Bono that was about to explode onto the scene, right? This was the U2 that had, had done pride in the name of love, but 
with or without you and still haven't what it found what I'm looking for hadn't come out yet. They were making that. Yes. Yeah. So Robbie Robinson's yep. kind of fooling around. He's like, all right, let me, let me, I'm going to fly out to England. I'm going to fly out to Dublin or Engl- uh, to Ireland, wherever they're, where they're doing it. Right. He had some, ho- he had some score sheets left over from the color of money. He had some horn arrangements left over. He goes, let me, I'm going to bring this with me. So he goes out to, to where they're recording with you too. And he shows them that. Um, and they come up with the, this, the, the, the first song that you hear with you two is called the uh, sweet fire of love, which was basically a 22 minute jam based on this horn sheet that they had. They kind of just made this a 22 minute kind of jam. And then they kind yeah. of cut it down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They took it. Then they took the horn arrangement again and actually used it for another song. They did testimony. Um, so, so they, yeah. so he got two songs out of one, like, like kind of horn arrangement sheet that was left over from the color of money. So that was that. So he kind of did that. And then Robbie Robertson's like, okay, let me go to England and look up Peter Gabriel. So that's kind of <laughs> how he did. He kind of, he kind of did it in reverse or you think it, it would have been Gabriel first, but he went out to see Lanois who was working with you two to kind of catch up with him. And then, and then flew to see Gabriel. Now the, one of the, the, the bittersweet things about this album is Richard Manuel, um, who was with keyboard, you know, piano player, keyboardist, and and sometimes drummer for the band. Mm-hmm. Um, he had he had taken his own life the year before. It was a big loss for Robbie Robertson, a big loss for the band. It was kind of like really. Mm-hmm. Um, so he had written a song called "Fallen Angel," which is what opens the the album. And Robbie Robertson went to Peter Gabriel and said, "Listen, can you, you know, would you like to help me on this?" And and you get Gabriel stacked vocals, you know, uh, used really used. Uh, in a way that it's, you know, not a very, very on Peter Gabriel ish. If, if you have preconceived, well, it's angelic Peter Gabriel. It's, yeah. It's very, very on, on Gabriel. It always is. I mean, that song, it, I don't listen to it that often, but when I do it, oh. I, I, you know, it gives you, yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting tingled. Yeah. I'm getting, I'm getting chills just the way it starts, you know, the out, the way the album opens, it opens with this song and it's like, it's like a heartbeat almost like the rhythms, like, a yeah, it's very rhythmic. It's very sort of, and it feels like it's a heartbeat. That's kind of pulsing indigenous. and, and everything kind of just yeah. kind of, everything just kind of the, perc- the percussion kind of comes up. Keyboards kind of come up. It kind of builds, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and then you get Robbie Robertson's vocal. And that's the thing is we talked about it in the last waltz is Robbie Robertson didn't sing in the band. He no. wrote the songs and there's, and there's some dispute about who, you know, other band members contribution, which we won't get into, but he was the lyricist, uh, but he never sang. Mm-hmm. And famously in the last waltz, his, his mic was turned off because he really wasn't a good singer. Supposedly um, you're either going to like, you're either going to like this or you're not going to like it. He's got a particular, he's got a gravelly voice, but it's, it is very soulful. It is very emotive. It is. Um, and his lyrics are, are fucking un, they're unmatched his lyrics on this album and storyville are unmatched like he just has a way of as a canadian of he invented the band invented like americana americana style music that's right them and credence were like the two yeah and his his lyrics on this album just like you, you sit there and you listen to it and it just connects and it's you know well it's it's no it's no wonder that Dylan Speechless. sought them out to have yeah. him as his backing band. I mean, you know, you can't get any more Americana than Dylan. I mean, you know, so, yeah. you know, but, but yeah, it, he's also channeling his uh, native American heritage as well yep. there. And I, again, I always love that, that trajectory that he has with all of his solo records that he's sort of such a, such a tapestry of, of just, of a little bit of blues and, and, you know, with Storyville, he's paying, you know, tribute to new Orleans and he's, yeah. and, you know, that he made those two albums. One was a soundtrack to a documentary about, yep. um, about the native indigenous, Americans. about native yeah. Americans. Yeah. He was then, he, he very connected to it. And then he um, even went a little electronica in the nineties with, uh, you know, under the, what was it? Under the, um, music from the red boy. Right? Yeah. Know, yeah. Music from um, the underground. That's right. And, ah. Uh, just and then of course you know working in two th- until in 2010 which was a complete thrill for me i had no idea that he had been working on a new record and he you know he comes out you know with clairvoyant cinematic 
right? Oh no, no it was clairvoyant. Had, had to be clairvoyant, had to be which was great. And then he came out with cinematic after that, like his his. That's right. Which was a couple and years he, later, I thought he was pretty much done at this point. Yeah, right. So of course I'm going to share. He's in no rush. Yeah, he, he, he and he said it. He goes, "I'm not interested in touring. I'm not interested in that kind yeah. of stuff." He goes, "I want to do things." But that when he did, me. but when he did release clairvoyant, though, there was uh, what was it? The, uh, the there was a band at the time, and he, I think you saw this band. Was it uh, which one? Dawes. That was Why, the band he, that he toured with for the. Oh Clarence really? Warren. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, oh, I didn't know that. Like oh. like the Bo De- like using the Bodines yeah. on this record. Uh huh. Dawes was like his backing band for oh. the Clairvoyant tour. Yeah. Did that? You, yeah. So he played some, some dates, and I don't know if it was successful though. or not. But it, I mean, but that, again, just that an extra that extra nugget, and of course Clapton played on that record, and you know did quite a few songs with him, as as I recall, and and it another beautiful record. It's just, yeah. I just love that. He's got a knack. That he's got, trajectory he's got some type of, of yeah, yeah. He's got, he's, he's got yeah. some type of knack for storytelling. Yeah. You know, even though he's, he's from Canada, the story, you know, he tells story about, you know, being on the Bayou or the Delta or, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, he lived it. I mean, he was really, him and Levon Helm were great friends. And, and a lot of those stories probably came from Levon Helm and a lot of that learning about that type of life. True. Um, yeah. And, and tour and being with the, with the band since the sixties and touring all those places, you, 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 be, you kind of get steeped in it as well. Well, he moved and, to know, they Arkansas were in, pretty yeah, early they, on in his life. I mean, he, yeah, you know, and they were did, steeped in the blues so, yeah. with all those, mm-hmm. all those artists. So yeah. uh, on this album, yeah, this is kind of like a, like a travel log through the shadow lands of his observations. Yeah. Um, and his vocal style is, I love it. There was just something about it. Sometimes it's, it's talky, like, like I somewhere the down talking. the crazy river It's very much, it's, it's very much like almost like a spoken word with, with some singing in between, but it's, you know, he's almost like you, he's monologue. Well, he's got the, well, he's got a great speaking voice. He's got, he's got that gravel. He's got that deep timber, not, not way down low, but he's got that timber to his voice, that lower register. And it's, that's yeah. right. And I can, just, I can listen to him. He should have done audio books. It's wonderful. <laughs> I can listen yeah. to him narrate yeah. because you listen to him in interviews and you just love hearing him. He has just got a great, a great, yeah, uh, and, and like you just said, about his, a knack of storytelling. He always has, he, like I said before, he, he just knows rock and roll like no other i think that just you know just yeah. being into the history of it and and being uh enthusiastic about talking about that it's not for everyone that this lifestyle is and he's not afraid to go there either yeah. and that's almost it almost killed him it almost killed all the members of the band at, the, at that time he's like this is not the a lifestyle that everybody should pursue because it's 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 you know being on the road and and it's yeah, just he's not, it takes, not not afraid to have a, to have that that cynicism in his lyrics but not in a mean way but just no but, but kind a truthful of an under, way. an understand yeah, an understanding of it you know it's a very um, pragmatic point of view but also yeah. he's you know but elevating it to that level of of of, of telling a story and yes and and then he tempers you know, it with his vocal stylings on this album you know and yeah. it's uh, the thing I noticed about this album, we, we talk about, tra- you know, we talk about track arrangements. This is one of those albums where it's slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is, you know, it's kind of, which is nice, which is nice because it really, um, it allows you to appreciate the slower songs and how he takes his time with them. Just like, like broken arrow. Mm-hmm. That's that song can, that song can absolutely wreck me. It, it like that's the way he does it mm-hmm. now. Rod Stewart did a version of it like four years later. <laughs> hey, you got to give him credit. You know, no, like, I can't. I can't. No, but I mean, to pick, but to pick a song that no, you know, yes. to, to probably it, nobody yes. had really heard at this point because this out, al- like I said, you know, this album did it, not make a big splash. So his version is is horrible. It's <laughs> it's, it's it's Rod Stewart affied, mm-hmm. and it like. The way Robbie Robertson sings "Broken Arrow," it's you can feel it. It it feels oh, like it's hot. Yeah, no, there's no comparison. Like it feels like it's no he's doubt. in the desert, and you feel you just kind of you feel the passion in it. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's like on you know, and, and so and so listening to this album again kind of brought those me experiencing that kind of music for the first time. You know, again, you know, being in into pop music and and ELO and stuff like that. You know, it's known for its technical prowess. And then kind of diving into something like this at that time and, and having someone who really kind of just uh, has a unique way of delivering the lyrics, mm-hmm. a unique tone in his voice, and then 
unmatched with the lyrical content was just like, wow. I'm like, holy shit. Like it, it really kind of, it, it kind of cuts you down. You know, if you're a music fan, uh, for me, at least it did. Maybe, maybe other people feel other way, you know, no, I other feel music exactly the feel same that way. way. Um, and, and again, it's, the, it's that ec- eclectic nature uh, of it. I think that's the word that I'm, I was yeah. looking for is the, it's so eclectic and it's so, um, I love when people, I, I just love a full, like collaborative spirit. I just, I just yeah. love that to death. I, I don't know when I, I'd like to think that everybody came in with the same enthusiasm to play on this album. I'm really, yeah, you know, I hope that was the case because it, you, you, you it shows because the music, yeah, I think know, so. ref, it reflects, it's not just people just coming in and, and doing their best. I think it's, it's, there's, there was a, uh, a sort of spiritual, yeah, I think they were not realizing yeah. that there was like the reemergence of Robbie Robertson was something yeah. special, you know, and the fact that, you know, like I said, you know, U2 was not that far away from Rattle and Hum, which was their exploration of America and and that type of a thing. So they were kind of, yeah. and this may have even, may have even helped to color that because right after Broken Arrow, you get Sweet Fire of Love, which is an out and out U2 song. It is, of course, it's got, yeah. the, it's got the jangling edge guitar, like it is it is Robbie Robertson U twoified and it is great though because you've got the Bono, you've got that Bono from the eighties with that soaring vocal when he when <laughs> yeah. he had that really impassioned, he had that re, he used to have that really impassioned way of singing like when mm-hmm. he sang like in the name of like pride in the name of love yep like this is the Bono that you get is that kind of that that heartfelt singing and maybe that's what you're that's what you're talking about is that song is just a celebration yeah you know. And and Bono and, and you two really kind of help carry Robbie Robertson, like kind of really bring him out because Robbie Robertson is really kind of singing also, really trying to you can't match he can't match Bono and he's not trying to. And actually on the on the album, it's really cool because uh Robbie Roberts is, is on one side of the the mix and and Bono's on the other side of the mix. He's mm-hmm. you know, so one's in the left side and one's on the right side. So it's really it was really cool listening to it. You hear like Robbie Roberts in here on the on the right, and then Bono singing on the left. And it's just ah, uh, this is this is what you know, this is what what is magic magical about music. Yeah. It's like you said, <clears throat> that that enthusiasm, people wanting to kind of contribute to this album. Like I said, Bodine's were, were nobodies, but it was a big thing for them or it was a big thing that Robbie Robertson wanted to work with them and kind of bring them into the fold, you know? Yeah. Um, and such a new band and, you know, yeah. bringing and just sort of giving that, that sort of leverage, but not in a, in a way to, Oh, we're, we're selling Bodine's here. It's like, they, they just flowed with the songs. Yeah. They, they okay. blended in, you know, and it just, Oh, and again, Sammy Bodine or or uh, yeah. what? Sammy Lannis, yeah, it's it's, Lannis. No, it's, it's, it's Lannis. <laughs> fantastic vocal. I mean, I mean, so, some people might disagree because you know he does. He has a very very high register, uh, but just interesting. And that's the thing. It's like and paired with Robbie's lower register, but not a great yeah. singer. It just you just have these voices, and it's just it's almost like a chant. It's almost like a. Yeah, it's you primal. really hear him on on Showdown at Big Sky. You you really yeah. you really oh hear him in the God. upper register. You really hear Sammy Lanas in, the, in song, the upper man. register. Oh, my um, God, that song. Yeah, the, that it's got the bass. it's got the funky bass. You know, doo, that fucking doo, doo, bass doo, doo, line. Doo, doo, that, you know, oh my God. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it really cook. It really cooks, and and that's um, that's a great thing. Is that that Robbie wasn't kind of you know saying he wasn't letting his the fact that he never sang uh, like on an, on an album before he wasn't really letting that hold him back mm-hmm. he's kind of like yeah I'm, i can do the the softer stuff was more in his wheelhouse because i think his voice really kind of it really kind of hits you there yeah um but he went he went for it with the with the other material as well he wasn't afraid to wasn't afraid to go for it you know it yep. showed on a big sky uh hell's half acre um uh american roulette you know those are the song those are more like the up-tempo songs and he's not he's he's there and his guitar is right there with him i mean these are like the the up tempo stuff is rocking stuff. It's not weird, it's not experimental. It is just you know you got you two on on two of them. Mm-hmm. So so you know you know what you're getting there. Um, and then you like I said, American Roulette and uh, Sweet Fire of Love, Testimony, which he named his album. He named his I mean I'm sorry, he named his autobiography Testimony. Uh, Hell's Half Acre, really good, just great, uh, great musicianship. Like you said, great energy, excited yeah. to work with him. 
Uh, and then, of course, Rick Danko makes an appearance on, on another one of my favorite songs. Uh, Sonny Got Caught in the Moonlight. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> just, the, you know, like it's just like the lyrics. It's just the way the songs are constructed. Yeah. Rick Danko singing just as a backing vocalist, really, and, and really singing way above Robbie because Robbie's got that, got that lower thing. And, and Rick Danko has that and can have that angelic voice also. Yep. Um, and it's just. Phew. And Gabriel making another vocal cameo in testimony in on the last track which is nice too uh also you know we didn't really you know talk about his guitar playing too which is extremely extremely creative he's a craftsman he knows yeah. exactly these are the kind of guitar players that i love that serve the song he's not overbearing he knows how to do a, a really great solo yeah he's not indulgent he's not a, he's not an in, overindulgent no, but it, soloist. it, it is yeah. it's, it, it is I, I I I often compare him to you know people like Mark Knopfler, who just know how to wield that that axe as, so as it were yeah. in the music and and yeah. blend it in and just it gives it mood it gives it atmosphere. Yeah, uh, you know, he's just you know, one of the yeah, greats. He knows how to he knows how greats. to use the tools in the toolbox. Just like yeah. like in testimony, you've got the horns there. Yeah. Um, and that's the only time the horns really show up. And, and it, so it really kind of punctuates that song. It kind of gives that song a little extra kick mm -hmm. as the closer. It's almost like a rave up testimony, you know, cause you got the horns and he he's, he's wailing, you know, literally wailing. Uh, and then you've got, you've got Bono there. It's just like a whole, like kind of closing of the album. It's a great choice as a kind of like a, you know, we're having a, you know, here's our, our last song. And we're just going to kind of really let it go and, and really let it out there. And that's yeah. Just, uh, yeah, he, yeah. He really uh, listening to the album is just kind of really a personal, uh, a personal thing with this album. This this album, you know, some of his stuff is a lot of his stuff is hard to listen to with other people from me just because a lot of it I listened to by myself and, and made those connections. It's not like party music or, you know. No, it's not. It's um, one of these. But it's one of those you know, albums that you and it's I. Perso it's personal stuff to me. Definitely. Yeah. We share probably 100 yeah. percent the same feeling, the same, you know, attitude about it. There's no, you know, Oh, I like this better than that, you know, kind of thing. Like sometimes we, we agree to disagree in a lot of things, yeah. but, uh, but with this album, it's, you know, this was definitely our, one of our biggest. Yeah. And it, and it was, and again, not a, not a, not a big, big album, you know, a lot of people, oh. I, I think it's very underrated. Um, not and I think it hits me more now. I, I think that's what it is. You know, I think it, I think I, I, so. At the time, I didn't have the the feelings that I have about the album that I have now. You know, there's well, something I, about maturing, about getting old. Like, you know, the, like the stuff kind of hits you. It, it's not nostalgic. Like this album isn't nostalgic. It's mm -mm. it's more of an emotional. It's more of an emotional response than it is a nostalgic. I listen to this. I'm like, oh, like sometimes like, you, like my my heart ache. My heart literally sometimes aches like listening to this. I'm just hearing his yeah. voice because you he know, not because he passed away, but just just the, because of the way he. Yeah he emotes. But when you think about it though, like he was already set to retire, you know, back in the day, like he was, you know, it's like I'm sick of the road. I don't want to do this anymore kind of thing. And it's just like to him, for him to come back in such a great way, in our, our opinion, um, you know, I urge people who haven't heard this album, if you're, you know, if you're a big fan of the band or a big fan of Dylan or, you know, give this album a shot. If you haven't heard it, you know, but some people, Oh, it's the eighties. It's, you know, it's just another one yeah. of those records that, you know, the, the, that, Oh, seventies artists coming into the eighties kind of, this is not that one of those albums. This is, this is an album that I feel was one of the best. Yeah. He and did it the right I, way. To, yeah. He, he this fall. day I, from, I knew it then and I know it now. I'm yeah. so confident in this record. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's just one of my all time favorites. He, he yeah. didn't, he didn't fall into any of the eighties traps. Yeah that that some of those 70s legacy artists fell into of trying to quote unquote modernize their sound right he didn't modernize his sound he updated his sound by by getting with the the right kind of artists at the time mm -hmm. that represented what he was trying to achieve it yeah. wasn't through technology it was through people that's right. i want to connect with these people that is so right yep. i don't want to connect with i don't want to connect with the dx7 synthesizer i want to connect with <laughs> well honestly yeah. right it wasn't about no, using the right. tools right it, it was about you know this is a very organic album you know there's not there's none of that 80s you know synthesizer -y stuff on here it's very mm -hmm. atmospheric it's very percussive mm -hmm. um yeah it's very like you said kind of like there's like a tapestry of of 
uh, or an audio, an audio landscape that he that he's creating through in each song. You know, if you were just- to if you were to equate it to film, I, mean, I could see. You know, because he, you know, did a little bit of acting, working with Martin Scorsese, of course, and I'm sure, you know, Marty's probably telling him all kinds of stories, filling his head with like the very the cinematic thing. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you listen to, I mean, you know, I think of, I think of some of the films at the time that came out around that time in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking of uh, Val Kilmer's film. Thunderheart. Uh, Thunderheart. And, you know, films of that ill, like just sort of like that that sort of Western noir kind yeah, of thing, de- you know, desert. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the guy, the, the drifter or the loner kind yep. of going, going through a town and kind of experiencing things or, or having a pat, you know, passionate love affair or love, you know, like, like that's what the, you know, a lot of these songs are kind of like kind of, yeah, they kind of emote that. And they're, they're like yeah. little mini, each one is a little mini story. Like American roulette is about yep. James Dean, uh, Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe, you know, uh, literally, uh, literally about them. Um, so yeah, he's, he's well steeped in it. And and you talked about, you know, not touring and stuff around this time, give or take, you know, the band, you know, the band, you know, that was where the acrimony was, is no one in the band except for Robbie Robertson really wanted to stop touring, but he said, you know, the, or the habits are out of control. So they kind of reapproached him and said, listen, you know, you want to come back and, and, you know, come back to the band and, you know, cause the, the intent was never to really break up. It was, you know, make more records, but kind of mm-hmm. be done as a touring thing. And he said, I saw an interview. It wasn't a recent interview, but I, I, I saw it recently. And he's, he said, you know, I kind of looked at the situation that was going on with them and it hadn't really changed, you know, that those things were still there. And so he said, I'm not going to partake, but by all means go, you, you know, use the name, the band, you guys got to make a living, do mm-hmm. it like you have my blessing so they, he never had a problem with them going out and touring as the band right. without him saying oh well you're you know you're not you're, you know it's not without me he's like go do it i just it's not for me like it's still yeah. not for me based on what i'm seeing you know and yeah richard manuel had 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 still had issues obviously that led to his taking of his life uh rick danko was still struggling with with substance abuse and i'm sure levon helm was a pretty heavy drinker mm-hmm that's not a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. So, yeah. So he kind of, you know, he kind of was, like I said, was looking for a challenge, which led to, um, which led to the, the collaborations with Scorsese. Um, yeah. You know, let's, I'm just going to run down some of the, the, the work that he's done that you, that film work that people are not aware of. This is again, either doing original music uh, sound executive, soundtrack producer, supervisor, whatever it is, film researcher, music yeah. researcher, yeah, yeah, yeah. for for it. So ready, here we go. Mm-hmm. Raging Bull, King of Comedy, Color of Money, Casino, Crossing Guard, Any Given Sunday, Gangs of New York, Shutter Island, Wolf of Wall Street, The Irishman, and his last film, Killers of the Flower Moon, yeah, which hasn't come <clears throat> out yet, which is about indigenous. Uh, Native American, so it's very apropos yeah. um, that his final collaboration with his good friend Martin Scorsese, he, he composed music for that film, which hasn't even come out yet. The trailers are just so he was working while he was while he was sick. Um, he was working, and him and Martin Scorsese lived together for a long time. And in, in the seventies, Scorsese was having problems. Mm-hmm. They were both having problems. They kind of came together, was living together, got each other straightened out. Um, the collaboration that a lot of, not a lot of people know. Everyone thinks that Scorsese is kind of a force unto himself, and he is. But Robbie, I don't know if Robbie Robertson is the muse or vice versa. You know, I don't know what it is, but those two, you know, you 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 heard the list that I just went through yeah. um, of of the collaborations they did. Uh, it's just he's this guy is just an amazing talent who always wanted just something different to keep. He wanted to keep being challenged. He said the road. Does you know it doesn't do it? You go out there and and some people love it. He said I got nothing against it. Some people can do it, um, but he wanted to do something different, and that's where it led to this this reemergence in '87. Uh, yeah, one of the this, great, this beautiful, beautiful album, all time great, Elder Statesman. Yeah, of just I wouldn't even just say rock of just music, period. Yeah, you know, steeped I, in I, it, steeped in yeah. it. Yeah. In the, no in the, yeah. in the lore. And he had the stories and he lived a lot of the stories yep. in the sixties, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I just saw, I just saw a, just a quick story, um, about his guitar in the last waltz. It was brought, it's, it's bronze guitar. Yeah. Um, 
it was that he actually had that dipped in bronze for the last waltz. It was a red Stratocaster, and he and he said he he, he hated the color red. He never wanted to play a red guitar. But when he bought, when he saw it in, I think it was in New York City, uh, was it Norm's Rare Guitars? He picked it up and he played it. And he goes, "Oh my God, I love this guitar, but I hate it because I never want to play a red guitar." But he goes, "It's calling to me," so he bought it in '73. And then for the last waltz, he, he had it dipped in in bronze, and he said, "This this will be the last time this guitar gets played. We're gonna we'll make it something special." Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a little thing on YouTube about this guy that got it. Uh, and then kind of re you know, finished it, you know, redid the neck cause it was all worn down. And then he brought Robbie Robertson in and Robbie opened it up and he's like, Oh my God, I can't believe it. You know, yeah, uh, all yeah. the original knobs were there. And he said, I used to, I, I, you know, I used to have the knobs like this cause I used to play. So, um, yeah, just, to, just that, like you said, you, you, you put it the right way. Like kind of like the elder States. I mean, there is some, some revisionist history that, that there's claimed to go on, right. You read his book testimony. Mm-hmm. I, well, right? to be fair, well, I, uh, I started it. <laughs> And now that, it, well, you know, not because he's gone, but, yeah. um, but I always wanted to get back to it. And I know that it only deals with that part of his life. It's, Up till the it, last it, waltz, I think it's, they said it that's, stopped. That's right. I, I, um, I, when I first bought it, I thought it was, you know, dealing with the later stuff as well. Yeah. yeah but, um, yeah. yeah so I, there, there's, there's some back and forth between, you know, the, the camps of, Robbie didn't write everything. How could mm-hmm. he have written everything? How could he have known about the Civil War? How could he have written, you know, the night they drove Old Dixie down? How, yeah. you know, that sounds like Levon Helm, you know. Um, so their their story, there was, you know, stories being lobbed on both sides. You got to kind of and agree. And, and I've just read a great story about, you know, uh, you know, the weight. You know, the when he's talking about Nazareth, he's talking about yeah. uh, Nazareth, PA. You know, which w- my brother and sister live right in Lehigh Valley. They live right near there. So it's, you know, to, uh, you know, but, but again, there's that, there's that uh, ambiguity to his, to his stuff. It can be so something, you know, but it also something, you know, could be very biblical or very, yeah. you know, legend or, you know, so it, and he had that ability to kind of blur the line there, you know, so yeah, I, I yeah that, that's that. what that Americana yeah. music was about yeah. is kind of yeah. about those experiences, like yeah. the quote unquote American experience. Yeah. Um, and I think this album is an extension of that. I think, you know, let, let's, let's look at it this way. If, you know, if Robbie Robertson didn't write this, didn't write all this stuff, how come the band never had any hits afterwards? They, they put out three albums after, after they broke up, mm-hmm. nothing really came of it. Yeah. You know, so you can kind of, let's, let's kind of lay the cards out on the table. And then you listen to this album and you listen to Storyville and you listen to this other stuff. And the, the, you know, the proof is in the pudding. That's the right. Lyrical content is there. It is not, it is not lightweight stuff. It is stuff that is, it, it, that hits you or that hits, you know, hit me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, again, hit I'm sure us. they, I'm sure they helped. I'm sure that, <laughs> yeah, hit us both. Yeah, and, 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 us and I'm both. sure the band yeah. helped out and I'm sure there was collaborate collaboration going on. But I have to believe that Robbie Robertson was the primary songwriter, and he probably got the primary credit. And you know, yeah, uh, when, know, when you're making the, when you're making the royalties on that, yeah, you start, you know, if you sign a bad deal, or or you kind of be like, okay, then you kind of, you know, start to not to be and too you, happy. You had about mentioned it. that him and Levon were good friends, and that's most yeah. likely true. But I know in his later years, though, he was very disgruntled, and he oh, was yeah. always he was like, he was angry. very like he was throwing shade at Robbie. Oh yeah, Constantly. for whatever reason. You know, like, oh, you know, yeah. he takes the credit for writing this song, but I had a hand in that and, you know, kind of thing. And yeah, so just some ugly stuff that just, yeah. you just kind of like Mike Love to... and Brian Wilson, kind of like that whole Beach right. Boys thing. It's yep. like, yeah, I, I actually helped this, but I didn't get the credit because he was, the thing. you know, it's like, all right. That's right. Know. Yeah. Um, it doesn't diminish, uh, the, the, what, you know, this album. And like I said, story, like the, his first two albums are, are, are complementary to each other. They're great. Mm-hmm. They're great back to back or dual listens. Um, cause I think he even, you know, he continues on Storyville. He continues that storytelling yeah. uh, aspect of things, you know, mm-hmm. and actually I, I just, I, I picked up Storyville. Was it earlier this year or last year? I had to order it. I had to order the vinyl from like Italy because it, it, mm. it didn't really come out in the U S I, there was, it, it was, you know, by 91, I think when it came out, albums were kind of already on the decline. Yeah. Um, so I had to like order it from overseas and it was taking a while to get here. I'm like, oh shit, man, this thing, this thing's going to come all chewed up and <laughs> destroy. You know, and I had to pay a lot of money because oh, A, you pay a lot of money because it's a, it's a hard album to find. And then it was coming from like Europe. And it's like coming and coming. And then finally one day it showed up and it was like, it was in great condition. I'm like, oh, thank God. Yeah. 
they even re released both couple. albums together. Yeah, as a, as, a as, a, as, as a special package with you know four extra tracks on it, yeah. uh, which is nice. So you know, again, there's that you know, like you say, it it you know, there's it's almost like a follow up, a yeah. really great follow up. But it was Robbie now stepping into the full on. Okay, now that I'm back, yeah, really feeling make, comfortable. I'm making my own album now. I'm you know, and the yeah. concept of really diving into the whole New Orleans thing, I thought was brilliant yeah. too. We had some great people on that record as well. Yeah, Bruce Hornsby and Bruce Hornsby, uh, he, Alan he, Toussaint, who, who was famous for, you know, of course the Neville brothers again, yeah. you know, appeared back, back in action with them. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he really, you know, he's able to do it genuinely. It doesn't, you know what, that's the thing is, is it doesn't seem performative. So yeah, he, yeah. he wanted to, he steeped himself into that whole, genre of music and working with those artists. And I think those artists, he, he has enough credibility where it's kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Come on down. You know, like I think also he's got that, that authenticity and that credibility that when he wants to do that kind of stuff, people are going to kind of embrace it and be like, yeah, well, Robbie. Yeah, of course. You know, I think he's just yeah. kind of like one of the, he was one of the good guys, you know, and I think, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, I think that's why with his passing, all, all of a sudden a lot of people are talking about him, but probably wondering why I, I guess if you're not into the band or weren't into this thing it's like okay why is everybody all of a sudden talking about this guy robbie robertson but mm-hmm. uh, if you've been sleeping on him for all these years it's time to wake up and it's yeah. time to you know it's not too late you know this music is here this this album his first it always album, will be just self, yeah. self-titled um it's just so it's so special you know and, and like i said you know when he when he it was a shock. We, I didn't know he was ill. So my, you know, when, I didn't either. When they announced it no too. Idea. It was like my, my heart really was just started aching. I'm like, God, you know, just, you know, with the freshness of Sinead O'Connor, just, you know, she was so young and he was, he was 80. So God bless mm-hmm. him. But I think, you know, I think we need to talk about, you know, where I think we're coming to the era where our idols are no longer going to be with us. Like, I think we need to face it's shocking. Each time, it's, yeah, I, you know, I, Glenn, I, Glenn Fry and Tom Petty. And I'm like trying to each, pace each myself, one of these is you shocking, know? you know. And I think we, <laughs> yeah. As I was listening to this, I, I need, I, you know, we're in a unique situation here. You know, we were we were young enough to be around for for some of the birth of rock and roll in the early days, and all these guys were young, and we were in the round in mm-hmm. the '70s, and they were in their their prime. And now they're not, you know, they they're still in their prime because a lot of them still tour and everything, but yeah. They're, you know, the, you know, some of them have longevity. Like Mick Jagger doesn't seem like he's ever going to stop. You know, mm-hmm. um, Roger Daltrey doesn't. You know, these guys never seem like they're going to stop. But time is, you know, time is not, not on their side. To coin, it's to not, coin, and to coin the, the not Rolling kind. Stones. It's not you know, kind, whether you um, like to think so or not. <laughs> you know, Jeff um, Beck. All, you know, yeah. all these, all these heroes that that we know and love. I, you know, I'm, I'm trying. I'm starting to have to wrap my my mind around like. Yeah, this is you know we're we're entering an age of you know we're, that probably people that played rock and roll in the '60s probably never thought they would see probably never thought this would continue into their '70s and their '80s mm-hmm. and, and continue these careers right it was always like in the '60s yeah. it was like a lark let's put a band together and let's you know that's new right. type of music um, and they've become so beloved to us right and, and we, they've been with us throughout our lives the Beatles have been with us throughout our lives you know. Yeah part of almost part, you know, if you're into music, almost part of what you are. It blows my mind when, when you lose somebody like Robbie, who, you know, like you say, he lived to the, you know, age of 80. And, but, you know, then you think back to when John Lennon got killed and you think back to when he was only 40. Yeah. And these artists that just died suddenly and, and just, you know, the early days of, of Morrison and Hendrix and, and, you know, just because of the excess and the, because of their, their wow. habits and such. And these guys were survivors in a way, you know, like, is that, yeah. I'm sure they part, they, you know, obviously partook as well. Yeah. Um, you well, know, look, I, if you look at Robbie Robertson in the last waltz, you know, he's on some stuff substances cause he's oh, rail thin. Oh, yeah. He is rail thin. Um, <laughs> And Not Clapton, real thin, he, but rail thin. <laughs> Clapton had a nice statement saying he, he goes, I'll, I'll see you soon. Uh, which gave, gave me a, a little bit of a shudder because he so, yeah. he, he outlived them all, man. Like who's left? Yeah. As far as guitar players, like felt like you know his fellow axemen. There's Jeff Townsend. Beck is gone. Maybe Townsend. Townsend and Page. Page and yeah, there's Gilmore. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you, uh, 
yeah, I mean, I never thought, you know, in a million years that, because Rob, the last time I saw Robertson on, on a, an interview, just maybe last year, maybe a couple uh-huh. of years ago, and it just looked, he looked good. Yeah, looked like Robbie. I know? didn't, yeah, I mean, do we really know what he died of? I mean, is, is it been yeah, confirmed? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was prostate cancer. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he'd okay. been battling it for a little while and you know, you, you, you fight the good fight. 80 is young. I mean, I said 80 had a good run, but um, like you said, for, for what the, you know, he, he had the foresight mm-hmm. to say, we need, I need to stop this. You know, I, I, like he, he kind of, you know, a lot of these guys don't see the handwriting on the walls. They get out luckily, you know, like the Eagles, like they, they you know, what the Eagles mm-hmm. put themselves through to come out on the other side. That was luck. You know, Joe mm-hmm. Walsh, the, you know, the excesses, that you know, that's that's not the norm. Robbie Robertson saw it and said, "This is not a a sustainable thing." Yeah, uh, I got to get out of here, and that's and then he, so he kind of re- receded. Let me do other things. Let me work on movies. Let me do a little acting. He was in that movie, The Crossing Guard, with Jack Nicholson. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was Angelica Houston's wife, I th- uh, husband, I think, in that movie, right? <laughs> like right. The, the second husband, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, he he, dabbled, yeah. he did he did a little of this, a little bit of that, you know. Um, and did things that made him happy. And I'm glad he was able to feel comfortable enough to come back out of, of his musical retirement and that we, and that you and I were kind of on the rise, mm-hmm. you know, in our musical education, we were kind of coming, you know, like we, we, we kind of knew who we liked. We, we liked our Genesis. We liked our ELO. We liked our Fleetwood Mac, you know, and, and mm-hmm. then ready for, you know, so we had our foundation built and now we were ready like this, just came kind of at it like a lightning bolt and kind of like, Whoa, this is different. Mm-hmm. It's new. It's, it's, it's not the, you know, not like the stuff I listened to, not like the ELO, not like the other stuff mm-hmm. uh, and hits you in, 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 in such a way. And the fact that, you know, f- you know, what almost 40 years later, 30, 34 years later, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can hit even harder, you know, that it's got that in, in those grooves of this record. Is, is something in there that this man yeah. put down on there. And, and, you know, maybe, maybe it's better off being one of our albums, you know, that people I, don't know hey, about, you know? Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to think that, I, you know, I'd like to but think, I think that. People, I, mean, I, I think that we need to share. I think, you know, if you're, you got, well, you got to be in the right, you got to be in the right, the right space for this album and, and let it wash over you. And mm-hmm. um, it's something special. And he, he really was is. something special. You know, he was one of, he was one of the good ones. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I, 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 you know, and again, I, I posted it on Facebook. I talked about it last Walt. I did get to see him, even if it was just for two songs. Better than um, me, more than I did. Um, it was such a, such a thrill, such a pleasure yeah. just to, just to see his face. Cause I saw him at the Crossroads Festival in 2007 and I saw him not just, performing but you know throughout the day the the great the vantage point that i had at that show was to see the artist all coming out and watching their fellow artists perform uh-huh. you know this all the sets and robbie was there quite a f- i saw him a lot he was standing there pretty much pretty much half the day and he was watching all the great acts and just loving it you could definitely yeah. tell he was you yeah. know he loved he loved music yeah he loved making music yeah. he loved being exposed to different types of music and being open to it and advocating, advocating for, you know, for his native American roots, mm-hmm. um, wasn't afraid to, to go there, you know, in, in a time when it may not have been too popular. Uh, but he, he was always someone who kind of stood out, stood on his laurels, you know, yeah. that was it for better or for worse. You know, he was, he kind of, he did it. Um, such a loss. Um, yeah. I am profoundly sad that he's gone, yeah. but I think, but the music, obviously speaks for itself and we'll always have that. Yeah. <laughs> so that'll, that'll stay with us and uh, God bless you, Robbie. Yeah. Bless, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so just, happy that, yeah. that we kind of discovered it when we did and, and are able yeah. now to, to continue to, tr- to kind of treasure it. I, I feel, I almost feel jealous for someone that, that listens to this now and hasn't heard it yet and, mm-hmm. and is able to make that connection. You know, that that's going to be hopefully something very special for them. I, I hope. Yeah. Um, if not, it's okay too, you know, but this is one of those ones. And, and Robbie was one of those artists that just kind of uh, was always there, always in the background and just kind of always doing things. And it's like, Oh, Oh, Robbie, Robert. Oh, he did this. He did casino. It's like, Oh shit, Robbie, Robert, you know, just kind of always popping his head up, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, 
So go go check this album out. It's it's Robbie Robertson. It's his solo out his first solo album. So it's just self titled Robbie Robertson. It's got the nice beautiful sepia tone uh, cover on it, and uh, the, the stuff the, he had that great head of hair, man. That that, yeah, that always that always the taus the tousled the hair. Yeah, the tousled and hair. How that hair just blends in with the clouds <laughs> and that, you know, that cover. It's so brilliant. It's a brilliant yes. cover. <laughs> yeah, he had, a, he had a great a great qua- always to the end. He his hair um, was like the guy never lost his hair. He always had his hair. No, he like, to, right to the and it was. I mean, I don't know if he dyed it or whatever. Oh, I'm but sure he, he did. But it was a great, you know. <laughs> but it still it was, looked good. Yeah, <laughs> it's, you know, he, yeah, he pulled it off because he still looked young. It didn't look like I mean, he may have had. I don't know if he had work done, but he didn't look like he did. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. His age. He kind of looked as it. He looked like, yeah. OK, he's older. He's an older guy. You know? Yeah. He didn't yeah. have like the stretched face if he did get a little a little bit. That's right. That. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that he's that vain to do it, but who knows? But uh, <laughs> yeah, fa- you know, uh, farewell, Robbie Robertson, uh, you know, and, and thank you for for all the great music. It's just. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's something it's, special it's stuff. Yeah. Stuff that, that we both treasure and, and yeah, we, we gushed about him in this episode, but he deserves it. And and this is one of the reasons why we, we do this show. That's right. Sometimes, sometimes open it up a little bit and, and put our hearts on our sleeve. Uh, and yep. that's, that's, that's what, what it's the all beauty, about. The beauty of music is, is, uh, when it's done right, no matter what genre it is, you know, and you've got, you know, if you've got that for you, I, I, I'm happy. Um, if you've got music in your life that that makes you feel a certain way or can bring out uh, certain things, there there's nothing better, right? There's nothing better in music. Nope. Special, nope. special stuff. That's that's going to do it for this episode. Find this album; it's on all the streaming services, so it is out there for you. So go go check it out. We you know we we implore you. We won't beg, but we implore you to check this one out. So. <laughs> uh, Robbie Robertson solo album from 1987. Check it out. Front to back, back to front. It's a great one. So that'll do it for this episode of the 3324 podcast. For Eric, this has been Dean. We will absolutely catch you on the flip side. You've been listening to the 3324 podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 